Greg, thanks very much. Let's get right to it. Let's start with the number one seeds in each region, beginning with the East, and it is Duke, the Blue Devils. Mike Krzyzewski making his 15th appearance with a team powered by National Player of the Year candidate Elton Brand. In the Midwest, Michigan State, Tom Izzo coached the Spartans to a Big Ten championship fueled by co-Big Ten Player of the Year, Mateen Cleaves. In the South, the Auburn Tigers. Cliff Ellis is at the helm of perhaps the most surprising team of the season, led by SEC Player of the Year Chris Porter. And in the West, Connecticut, Jim Calhoun's Huskies are Big East champions, and Richard Rip Hamilton is co-Big East Player of the Year. And to the brackets now, we begin in the East with teams who will go to Charlotte for Friday Sunday games. The Duke Blue Devils take on Florida A&M. The Rattlers of the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference come in with the worst record at 12 and 18. College of Charleston in their first season in the Southern Conference, the Cougars didn't lose a single league game. They'll play Tulsa, the Golden Hurricane, out of the whack. Wisconsin, the Badgers lost six of their last nine. They'll take on Southwest Missouri State. The Bears get an at-large bid from the Missouri Valley Conference. Tennessee will try to win its first tournament game since 1983. They'll take on Delaware. The Fighting Blue Hens will represent the America East Conference. So there's a look at the top half games. They'll play Lafayette. The Leopards are back in the tournament for the first time since 1957. Texas, the Longhorns rebounded from their 2-7 and seven start under new coach Rick Barnes. They'll play Purdue, the Boilermakers, in after dropping five of their last six. Cincinnati, the Bob Huggins Bearcats handed Duke its only loss of the season. They'll take on the George Mason Patriots of the Colonial Athletic Association. And Temple, it's the 10th straight visit for the Owls. They'll take on Kent of the Mid-American Conference. The Golden Flash is making their first NCAA appearance. So there's the bottom half of the East. Those games will be at the Fleet Center. And now we headed back to New York and Greg Gumbel. All right, Michelle, thanks. So as we take a look at uh, the College of Charleston heading back to Charlotte, as we suggested, where that 25-game winning streak began, uh, what do you look at when you see the College of Charleston there, Clark? Well, that's a heck of a matchup with them in Tulsa, but they wanted to try to get a higher seed. They were hoping to avoid that eight seed where they end up most likely having to face Duke. All right, they're the number two seed. As for Southwest Missouri State, the number 12 seed, well, take a look at their reaction as they saw the brackets unfold, and they're headed for a matchup with Wisconsin. Wisconsin, very deliberate basketball team, but you love that drama and excitement for Southwest Missouri State. All right, meanwhile, now, the bottom half of the bracket, you would see at the bottom there, Miami of Florida, number two seed. What do you see for them down the road? Well, looking down the road, there could be a very intriguing matchup between them and Cincinnati if the seeding holds true in terms of what happens on the court. And George Mason, how did they react as they saw their number come up? Ah, the Patriots are mighty happy, and they're headed for a matchup with Cincinnati. <laughs> Physical team, but nothing like being in the tournament. All right, Clark, we will return to Michelle in Kansas City for the Midwest bracket when the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show continues live here on CBS. Time now for the Midwest region. We begin with the top half of the bracket, the Friday-Sunday games at the Bradley Center in Milwaukee. Michigan State, the Spartans come in with their highest seed ever. They'll take on Mount St. Mary's. Jim Phelan became just the fourth coach ever to notch 800 wins when the Mountaineers won the Northeast Conference title. Villanova, the Wildcats, got a boost from their win over St. John's to finish the regular season. They'll play Ole Miss. The Rebels are 0-3 all-time in the tournament. UNC Charlotte, the 49ers, made a great run through the Conference USA Tournament. They'll play Rhode Island, the surprise winner of the Atlantic 10. Arizona, the Wildcats, won their only national championship as a number four seed in 1997. They'll play Oklahoma. It's the fifth straight appearance for the Sooners. That is the top half of the Midwest in Milwaukee. Now to the bottom half. These are Friday-Sunday games in New Orleans. The Utah Utes, last year's runner-up, gets a number two seed. Coach Rick Majerus has never lost a first-round game. They'll play the Arkansas State Indians of the Sun Belt Conference in for the very first time. Washington, the Huskies will try to repeat last year's Sweet 16 run. They start out with Miami of Ohio. The Red Hawks will be carried by MAC Player of the Year, Wally Zerbiak. The Kentucky Wildcats, the defending champions, they are 17-1 in their last 18 tournament games. They'll play New Mexico State. The Aggies won the Big West Conference last night. Kansas, the Jayhawks haven't been seeded lower than five since 1988, when as a sixth seed, they won the national championship. They'll take on the Evansville Purple Aces. They get an at-large at bid out of the Missouri Valley Conference. So here is a look at the bottom half of the Midwest bracket. These teams go to the Louisiana Superdome. And now we're going to check in with Jim Nance and Billy Packer standing by in Chicago. 
All right. Thank you, Michelle. Michigan State, Billy, certainly looked like a number one seed and a national title contender today by winning for the eight. Ago, they were wondering if they're even going to be in the tournament with beyond the bubble. Well, here they are, a five and a dangerous five. And Oklahoma has the worst seed of any at-large team, so you can deduce that had Illinois won today here in Chicago, Oklahoma would have been out. You're putting eight teams in the Big Ten in. We'll hear about that later. All right. Now, meanwhile, this is the bracket in New Orleans. Look at this possible second round matchup. It could be a historic battle. Kansas and Kentucky, they both won their conference tournaments today. They can meet in the second round. They really did. Kentucky, a three there. That's kind of surprising in a way. And, and you get in a situation there where you have the number one winningest team of all time against the number three all time mm. in the second round. Wow. Yeah, unbelievable. Wow. What a match that could be. And how about the Washington Huskies? Just a split second away a year ago and the Yukon Huskies beat them. And they will be taking on Miami of Ohio in the first round. You know what that means, Billy? Saw Wally Serbiak this summer, an outstanding basketball player. This is a team to be reckoned with. Meanwhile, Utah's also in that bracket in New Orleans. And for the fourth straight year, Rick Majerus' team is in the same end of the draw as Kentucky. Well, he hated to see Kentucky before, but this is the first time in the 90s he's been rated higher. All right, let's go back to Kansas City and back to you, Michelle. South beginning with teams who will go to Indianapolis for Thursday's Saturday game. So the top half of the South bracket, Auburn SEC Player of the Year, Chris Porter, will lead the Tigers. And they will take on Winthrop. The Eagles won the Big South Conference Championship to earn the school's first ever berth. Syracuse, Big East Defensive Player of the Year, Eton Thomas makes the Orangemen a tough draw for Oklahoma State. But the Cowboys are riding the momentum of a great Big 12 tournament run. UCLA, the Bruins will be without freshman center Dan Gadzurik out with an knee injury. Baron Davis will play with a sprained right toe. They'll take on the Detroit Titans, the Midwestern Collegiate Conference champions. Ohio State, the Buckeyes went from last place in the Big Ten last year to almost first this year. They'll take on Murray State. The Racers won their third straight Ohio Valley Conference. That is the top half of the South bracket. Now to the bottom half, and these teams will go to Orlando for Thursday, Saturday games. Maryland at number two. The Terrapins have their highest seed since 1980. They'll take on the Valparaiso Crusaders. Last year, Cinderella returns. Louisville, the Cardinals in after an historic, successful appeal of its postseason band. They'll take on Creighton. The Blue Jays come in as Missouri Valley Conference champions. St. John's, the Red Storm, earns its highest seed since they were number one in 1986. They'll take on the Samford Bulldogs, the Trans-America Athletic Conference champions, making their NCAA debut. Indiana, the Hoosers are one and four in the NCAA tournament in the last four seasons. They'll take on the George Washington Colonials, featuring Atlantic 10 Player of the Year, five foot four inch Shante Rogers. Orlando Arena is the destination for the bottom half of the South, and we are three quarters of the way there. Right now, let's send it back to New York and Greg Gumbel. All right, thanks very much, Michelle. You know, as we look at that South bracket in Indianapolis, the first thing my partner says is, <laughs> where is Ohio State? Where is Well, they're a number four seed in the South, and should they get past Murray State, and should number five UCLA get past Detroit, that makes for an interesting matchup. It really does, the potential of two of the best point guards in the country going head to head. Easy track for the Buckeyes and their faithful to get over to Indianapolis. Now talk about looking down the line as you look at the matchup in Orlando. If St. John's moves ahead, as does George Washington, take a look at what you have there. You've got Mike Jar Jarvis who just left George Washington taking on this former school. If in fact that happens, it's dangerous to look ahead, but it's always fun to do so. But that's your job. Yeah, that's right. what you that's do. Part of it. This reminder for you, be sure to go online tonight at 8.30 Eastern time to chat live with our own Clark Kellogg. He'll go over the brackets and answer your questions about them at CV 90s for the Huskies, but they've never advanced to the final four. They'll play Texas San Antonio, the Southland Conference champs. Missouri, this was the Tigers' best season since they won the Big 8 in 1993-94. They'll play New Mexico. A strong whack tournament run gives the Lobos a number nine seed. Iowa, it's the last time Tom Davis will lead the Hawkeyes into the tournament. They'll face UAB. It's the first tournament appearance for Blazers coach Murray Bartow. Arkansas, thanks to a nice run in the SEC tourney, the Razorbacks wind up with a number four seed. They'll take on the Siena Saints. And file this, the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference champs are the nation's number one free throw shooting team. So this is the top half of the West Thursday, Saturday games at McNichols Arena. Now down to the last eight teams, the bottom half of the West to be played in Seattle at Key Arena, a Thursday, Saturday schedule. Stanford, the Cardinal, is sporting its highest seed ever as they try to return to the Final Four. They take on the Alcorn State Braves, champions of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. 
Minnesota, the Golden Gophers, will take on the Gonzaga Bulldogs, the West Coast Conference champs have won 25 games this season, most in school history. North Carolina, the Tar Heels earn their 25th straight bid. That's the longest streak ever. They'll take on the Weber State Wildcats, who come in as the Big Sky Conference champions. And the Florida Gators, Coach Billy Donovan making his first NCAA appearance. They'll take on the Penn Quakers, winners of the Ivy League champion. There are the eight teams heading to Seattle, and that completes the field of 64. We head back now to Chicago and Jim Nance and Billy Packer. All right, thank you, Michelle. There are some broken hearts out there right now, but how about UConn heading west? What do you think of that? I think it's a good move for them. You remember the last time they went west this year, they took on Stanford out there, and Jim, I, I think it really helps this basketball team. They don't want to, you know, the Meadowlands where they've had some heartbreak. Well, and how about New Mexico? Some thought they were on the bubble. They actually merited a number nine seed. And the Siena Saints are in. They're going west, Billy. They'll take on Arkansas in the first round out in Denver. Rutgers waiting word. Kevin Bannon's team left on the outside with an 18 and 12 record. And Xavier's 21 and 10 mark, not good enough to get in. Well, the Atlantic 10 got three teams in. Xavier had that chance in the conference tournament, didn't get it done. All right, Billy, you're going to be talking with C.M. Newton, the chair of the NCAA Men's Basketball Committee. Committee and director of athletics at the University of Kentucky. And joining us again from Chicago is Billy Packer, celebrating his 25th year of broadcasting the NCAA tournament. Billy, I do believe you have a few questions for the chair. Well, CM, I watched you yesterday on the screen from here in Big Ten country, and you seem so calm and relaxed. What happened on Saturday with all of those upsets? <clears throat> oh, goodness, Billy. We were calm and relaxed uh, yesterday afternoon, and then uh, a lot of things happened. Some upsets occurred, and um, we w frankly, we worked very late into the, the night last night uh, to try to get this, uh, this field uh, not only uh, selected, but get them seated and bracketed, and we, we, had a, we had a good run at it. Well, CM, I want to start right off with the four number one seeds. A lot of people wondering uh, who was going to get them. We, and, and I understand that you seed them one, two, three, four with Duke, Connecticut, Michigan State, Auburn in that particular order. Why does uh, Connecticut get moved? Well, the, the reason is is because Duke is the number one seed. You know, we, we do an S-curve uh, for the um, top four lines and the bottom four lines. And, and Duke came out clearly as the top team in the country. Connecticut came out second and, uh, and uh, had to go out of region as a result of the fact that Duke was the number one seed. Those big upsets uh, at the end with Stanford, Cincinnati, uh, Maryland, clubs like that, were any of them in a position even as late as this weekend to be a number one seed? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, we went into this last day, uh, particularly last night, really unsure. Uh, and and uh, when the upset started happening, then we had to revisit uh, the top line as well as those next couple of lines. You know, history could have prevailed if Illinois had been successful today and won this conference championship for the getting in on the automatic bid. Were you guys in a position to say that the Big Ten deserved eight teams in this tournament? Well, we had already, you know, uh, we don't think in terms of conferences other than the automatic qualifiers, so we weren't paying any attention to how many of those teams were coming in. We were paying attention comparing Team X against Teams Y and Z. So that was really not a factor. The fact is that uh, we had, uh, as it turned out, seven teams in, and had Illinois won, they, they would have won their way into the championship. So it would have been eight, so somebody owes uh, Tom Izzo uh, a, a little bit of a dinner there, because Michigan I, I State... I would think so. You won't yeah. tell us who that team is that deserves no, that. No, I, I don't think I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Let me jump over to something that's near and dear to your heart, because I know in addition to be the, the, the head of this committee, you also are the athletic director at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky and Utah have faced each other in 93, 96, 97, 98, and maybe here in 99. Uh, is there any reason that they, uh, th that rivalry continues in NCAA tournament play? Billy, only you would probably pick that, although I'm sure some others will as well. Uh, that was discussed, and it was discussed at some length. The fact is uh, we've got a reverse situation of what's happened in the past. You've got Utah rated higher than Kentucky, and uh, uh, you don't break up the field because of, of past rivalries necessarily. You look at it, that is a consideration but uh, you, you can't uh, be worrying about breaking up brackets in order to accommodate that type of thing. And one other thing, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of letters from ACC country in regard to just three teams from the Atlantic Coast Conference in when uh, Atlantic 10-3, Missouri Valley 3, Conference USA 4. Uh, was there any reason, what was the feeling about that league this year? Well, again, uh, you know, other than the automatic qualifiers, you don't worry about leagues. And when you started looking at the teams that were close to getting in, the teams like Wake Forest, 
who really needed to win a game in the tournament, uh, and they didn't do that. North Carolina State did, but then you look in comparing them against others with non-conference schedules and so on. As it turned out, the ACC just ended up with three, and, and uh, that is a shock to, to I think, everyone. But uh, um, that they have to play their way in, and, and in, the fact is these teams did not do that. Billy Packer, Greg Gumbel in Chicago, thank you very much. CM, congratulations on another terrific job by the selection committee, and uh, have yourself a terrific tournament. Thanks, this Greg. reminder for you all tonight. Yeah, that's about as high as it gets, and RPI factors in all kinds of things like the strength of schedule and your opponent's opponents and all that stuff. Mississippi State did not have a very good RPI, but they did close with a flurry in the SEC, and Coach Rick Stansbury joins us now. Coach, from the SEC tournament, after you won your quarterfinal game, you said, quote, your bubble has burst. I know you were very, very confident and have to be surprised and obviously disappointed. Well, Chris, you know, naturally we're very disappointed because, um, you know, really felt like this team here had earned the opportunity to participate in this tournament. And when you look at what we've done, you know, we won 20 basketball games um, in one of the best leagues in America. Uh, we've won seven out of the last 10, seven out of the last 11, counting yesterday. And of those three or four losses, uh, three of them were against top 25 teams. Uh, two against Arkansas we lost. And the other loss came against the number two team in the country, Auburn. So you look at the way, way we finished in this regular season, winning 7 out of 10, 7 out of 11, and the people that we got beat by, uh, I don't understand exactly why uh, we weren't selected. I know it's better to see Ole Miss go in there. You're arch rival from the state there with a nine seed. Something you could control, your rally fell short. I know you, you might be haunted by what might have been had you been able to beat Auburn at the end of the season. But something early in the season that you could control, that non-conference schedule, which is rated 175 by the RPI, those teams like Centenary and Tennessee Martin, obviously that's going to be the reason why you didn't get in, according to the committee. Well, Chris, I, I'm not for sure what makes up at RPI, you know, and we have no control of that. But here's the thing that, you know, that I know. We play in one of the best leagues in America. We play a 16-game schedule. We played 19 SEC games this year. Plus, we played a team out of the ACC. Uh, we played the winner of the Big 12 Conference in Texas. So we had 21 teams uh, with that type of power rating. Now, I don't understand exactly where our RPI came in. And I always thought that you know the way your team finished, and uh, especially being in this league, when you win 20 basketball games and you're able to win you know, seven out of your last 10 games, uh, we sure thought this was enough to get us in. And, what, what I'm disappointed back is about is for our team and these players. You know, these players have played extremely hard, and they put themselves in this position, and there's no question about it that they're one of the best 64 teams in the country. Hey, Rick, uh, Dick Vitale. Uh, I think Chris hit something in terms of a home run when he asked you about the pre-conference schedule. I know you mentioned uh, some of the people you played. Will this affect your scheduling philosophy in terms of maybe next year in the future, schedule a little bit more in terms of big-time teams early on your uh, schedule in pre-conference? Well, Dick, I, I still think this is important. You have to win basketball games. And, you know, this SEC schedule, when you play 19 SEC games, Plus, you play an ACC team in Florida State. You play the winner of the Big 12 uh, Conference. That's 21 games. And you look at the strength level of those 21 games, um, we sure thought that would be enough right there, Dick. Well, Coach, we know you're disappointed. We thank you for taking time to join us. I hate to say this, but best of luck in the NIT, and we'll be interested to see that the schedule comes out next year. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Chris, Dick. <laughs> You've been there? Disappointing. Oh, yeah. I think no. he was very confident, and obviously his kids felt like they were NCAA-bound. Well, the committee, you got to give the committee credit. They take a look at two things. They look at your season, your entire season, and then you look at a conference tournament where maybe that just counts one game because you get beat there. It doesn't mean anything. But I really felt the 10 games that they played early against not really power schools where everybody else was playing the power matchups. We see Kentucky Duke going at the Big Ten, the Southeastern Conference, the Pac-10 games. I think that's what you have to do today in order so that when you get 20 wins, they're quality wins, and I think that's what knocked them out. I think they have the ability to set the agenda, and that's why I said I want to see Mississippi State schedule when it comes out next year, those games in November and December. Disappointment in Starkville, but certainly a landmark day for the Missouri Valley Conference, one of those mid-major conferences that can be very dangerous in the NCAA tournament. you got a couple of coaches there who are happy to get at large bids. That's Jim Cruz from Evansville on the left there, his team, an 11 seed, and Steve Alford from Southwest Missouri State on the right there. They get a 12 seed. 
Gentlemen, those uh, seeds suggest you just barely stuck in. Coach Steve, I know you had to be uh, sweating a little bit. You lost three times to Creighton and a couple times to the guy on the left side of the screen there. Well, we're just thankful that uh, our draw wasn't with Evansville and Creighton. Uh, they're two outstanding teams, and we're real happy for our team. Our players have worked real hard, and our program's come a long way in the last two years. We're, uh, we had an RPI of 42 two years ago, and we're on the other end. So uh, this feels a lot better, and we're excited about being in the tournament. Are you excited about playing Dick Bennett in Wisconsin, though, in the first round? That's one of those tempo battles that's tough. Well, that's the other side of it. Uh, you pull to get in the tournament, and then once you get in the tournament, uh, you know you're going to be faced with an uphill battle. And uh, Coach Bennett does a tremendous job there. It's a very disciplined program. They don't beat themselves. And uh, we'll have to play very well. But uh, we've been playing pretty well. And I think uh, the character of our league uh, hopefully will show through because we've been in a very tough league all year. All right, Steve, congratulations. We wish you well. Thank Jim you. Cruz, you guys also get in as an 11 seed. You didn't have any wins over an NCAA-bound team. That might be the kind of program that maybe those who didn't get in might say, wait a minute, why is Evansville in? State your case. Well, we really don't have a case, uh, <laughs> to tell you sure, it's Chris. You don't have to oh, when you get in, I guess. Well, you really don't have to, and I, I've always been content. They have all these uh, theories, and it's like Nintendo or Sega. I mean, we, we try to play the games that we can on the court. We try to win on the court, and uh, we're excited about it. When you get in that large bid, uh, particularly from a conference that I think is a very tough conference like ours, but it's not doesn't have a lot of notoriety, is that you're judged on the whole season. It's just not how you finish or how you did in the middle. Or We won a league championship, and uh, I think our kids were very consistent throughout the year. Hey, Jim, Dick Vitale, I'll tell you one thing. we got two Hoosiers there, you and Steve Alford. I know Bobby Knight's got to be happy for both you guys, but I'm really happy as well to see teams in the mid-major conferences rewarded, like last year the committee rewarded the Midwestern Conference with three teams. And now you're going to hook up, though, with one of the giants in college basketball, Kansas. Tell us a little bit about your team. About our team, Dick? Yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about your team, Jim. Uh, well, we have uh, a good shooting basketball team, which gives us good spacing. Uh, we like to run, Dick. Uh, we play nine guys. We think we have a good bench. Uh, these guys have won because they've had a tremendous togetherness. They get along tremendously well. Uh, the pro you know, how long the season goes, you're going to have problems, and these guys have been able to adjust uh, through the problems and, and get stronger through problems, and uh, it's really neat. They've really had a great year. It started last year, really. We had a team that finished... 15 and 15, and they were very, very coachable. They worked hard, and uh, sometimes you don't get rewarded, but they set, certainly set the foundation last year with last year's team. Jim, it's Digger. If, if you look at the Missouri Valley Conference, not many people gave it respect that three teams could go in. We saw Steve Alford last year not make it. Now, when you see three teams in, the credibility of the conference comes up. You know the feeling what you had last week waiting to get in. Now that you're in, give us some insight to the strength of the Missouri Valley Conference itself. Well, I think the Missouri Valley was, uh, I've been very, very lucky. I've been around a lot of good basketball for a, a long time in different leagues. And uh, I think this year in the Missouri Valley from top to bottom was uh, extremely uh, difficult, no matter if you're playing at home or road. Actually, I, uh, we had a better team uh, on the road for some reason than at home. And I think that any team, any time uh, that you just want a game, I think this is what uh, our kids did a great job with. They didn't look too far ahead because it was a little bit overwhelming. And, they just kind of stay with the old coaching cliche, play one game at a time, and uh, we're very happy about the uh, outcome. Any coach that overlooks Evansville will be in trouble. But Roy Williams has been around a long time. He knows not to do that. Coach, good luck to you. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Chris. The contrasting emotions of Selection Sunday. There is joy in the Missouri Valley Conference. You see Evansville jumping up. Collective high five. There is gloom in Starkville as the Bulldogs, not where they want to be, are headed for the NIT, but not the field of 64. We're coming back. 62 years old is headed to the NCAA tournament. He'll take on the Buckeyes of Ohio State. See Auburn, the number one seed up there as they draw Winthrop, a 21 and 17. Syracuse and Oklahoma State would be a potential second round matchup. Cliff Ellis is the coach of the Auburn Tigers, which holds on to its number one seed. You got a nice cheering section for you, Cliff. Congratulations in advance. You're going to be everybody's coach of the year. But now the business of the NCAA tournament and your team that has suffered defeat two out of the last three games. A concern there. They really hadn't been tested for big chunks of this season, romping through games. Well, anybody that gets in a tournament this time of year deserves to be there. Our team has lost to Kentucky and Arkansas, but there'll be a lot of people that lose to Kentucky and Arkansas 
this time of year because they're a very good basketball team. We're a good basketball team. Anything can happen this time of year. We'll see what it happens. Your initial reaction on the draw there, you see that if you can get by Winthrop, we're going to make that assumption because no 16's ever beaten a one. Oklahoma State against Syracuse in the second round. Well, first of all, Chris, I know, you, I can't, know. <laughs> you can't overlook Winthrop. Uh, they deserve to be there. Uh, naturally, they're a good team. Uh, then we'll look past that after that basketball game. But we're excited to be there, as you can tell. The Auburn people are very excited, and uh, it's been a long time coming for this group. I know Dick wants to ask you a question. Dick, go ahead. Hey, Cl hey Cliff, I hope you get a U-Haul truck to get all your gold trophies as National Coach of the Year. And well, you certainly nice. deserve them, Cliff. But I want to Thank ask you. you this. Let's assume you get by Winthrop, which you will. Let's get by them. Now, who would you prefer to play? An up-tempo team like Syracuse or a team that plays controlled basketball like Oklahoma State? Well, we like an up-tempo game, and I think an up-tempo game suits us the best. Naturally, I think when you get to the NCAAs, you're going to get into some more control-type tempo games. But really, we've handled either one. Uh, Florida State was a team that controlled the tempo. We went to Florida State, won a game such as that. This team has handled virtually every situation. So, Dick, I think this team will respond to whomever we play. Chris, I've been impressed with you. You take a look. Everything will happen all year with this team, Chris. But Cliff Ellis has done a great job recruiting when you look at Mr. Porter coming in as a junior college transfer. But the fact that you pound the offensive boards close to 20 a game and on defense, 10 steals a game when you force those 20 turnovers a game, that is something that has impressed me all year long. You have sold these kids on defense and offensive rebounding. Well, Digger, it's, it's a situation where it's an attitude when it comes to rebounding and defense. We started this program with a blue-collar approach, and then marquee players like Doc Robinson, Chris Porter have come into the program, and uh, we're getting there. It's, now, I wouldn't have believed at the beginning of the season we would have accomplished as much as we did. I thought we, was, we were an NCAA tournament team, but to be a number one seed, it's a Cinderella story, and these kids and fans deserve all of this that's going on. But after this, we've got to get back down to earth and just go practice and get ready to play a game. Cliff, it's a great job. I remember seeing you in an elevator at the Final Four when you had just gotten the Auburn job. And we were talking about the challenge that lied ahead. Here you are, a, a number one seed. But your it's team, yeah, your team has tasted defeat now. Do you worry that if you don't get out in front of a team and get the big lead and kind of run and dunk and do the things you do so well, will they be able to handle the pressure? They don't have a lot of experience in the postseason and, and tasted defeat down there in the SEC tournament. Well, I think we're, what I'm going to try to do is, is rely on the experience of having been in the NCAA. Uh, these players haven't been there. Auburn played a Richmond, lost. South Alabama at Louisville one year. It was the first time we had a chance to win. We almost beat Louisville. Uh, those are the things I will try to take to this team to get them to understand that anybody you play deserves to be there. You better bring your best foot forward. Cliff, we'd like to congratulate you again and thank you and your cheering section. Welcome back to the NCAA tournament. It's been about 10 well, years. Glad to have you. Thank you. Good to, good to be with you, Digger and Dick. I'm hoarse, Dick, because I was singing last night. <laughs> they have a tradition down there at Auburn. It's called Rolling Tumor's Corner. When they throw toilet paper in the trees to celebrate a big victory, Tumor's Corner should be rolled tonight. Dick, your thoughts on Auburn as a number one seed in their first time in a tournament in 11 years. Unusual situation. Well, they deserve to be a number one seed. They really do, especially with Maryland losing. I thought Maryland had a chance to catch them. But if I were Cliff Ellis, I remember being with him the day he got the job at Auburn, and he didn't know basically he could get it done. Well, let's say to him now, Mr. Ellis, go see Dave Housel and get a raise, baby. Go get some cash. But when you look at this club, very athletic. Chris Porter is a high wire act. He's a human highlights film. But they have great guard play as well. Robinson and Pullman really do a super job handling the basketball. They're really outstanding in transition. They defense really well, and they rebound, as Digger said, exceptionally well. But when I look at that region, mm -hmm. all I simply see is one team popping out of me, and if I were Maryland, I think I'd like to be where I am. I think Maryland's going to be very tough to deny out of that region. 
Well, both Digger and I feel the same way. You see that South region. You see some teams that can compete athletically with Auburn. We'll break down the other three regions. We'll visit with some more coaches. But as we take you to break here, here is the conference breakdown. History making, of course, with the ACC only getting three teams in for the first time since the field of 64. We'll talk more about this. The Big 12, one of the big winners, despite not a very strong computer ranking all season long. Big 10 gets seven. Come on, come on, he's taking too long. I should have gone. Yeah, he should have gone, man, he should have gone. Do it. He's coming, and he's gone. This is all I can get. You did good, Billy. You did real good. Very interesting for the committee to have to place teams around, and maybe it's one of the reasons why the seedings didn't change at all from the conventional wisdom that had been thrown out there on all the mock draws you see all week long, with Duke, Auburn, Michigan State, and Connecticut being the top seeds. Back to our man in Kansas City at uh, tournament headquarters there, Jay Billis. Jay? Chris, obviously the seeding for the number one seeds and the number two seeds were affected by the losses that were suffered over the weekend by teams like Auburn and Stanford and Maryland. But the committee uh, representative of the committee told me just a few moments ago that it wasn't the top seeds that was the most difficult for the committee. It were the seeds six through 11, that grouping of seeds, that 24 teams that were so much alike and so hard to distinguish among that gave the committee the hardest time. They really agonized over it, as well as the seedings of the teams near the bottom of each bracket. They spent an awful lot of time looking over extra data in order to get those seeds just right. So so that they got four balanced regions and in my opinion they did a pretty good job of it although the east looks like a very difficult draw I think they always do a pretty good job but we think the south here looks pretty tough jay thanks we'll hear from you later and also joining us later on from kansas city is cm newton the chairman of that ncaa selection committee digger you always have a few nitpicking things besides the fact you think they made it does a pretty good job yeah i really do i really thought when they went to utah and based on what they did starting the season out five and four Rick Majerus just decided, let's teach defense. He got a great player in Andre Miller, but it was Utah's defense. As an example, when they went into the pit and played at New Mexico, holding New Mexico at home, 39 points and 31% field goal defense, this is where Utah stepped up their game. They played very strong, won the WAC conference tournament, and now they become a two seed where I think they earned a two seed. You do think they earned a two seed. Absolutely. Some Utah fans might have been dreaming about a number one seed, but again, they just didn't have the, the quality non-conference wins that the top four one seeds did. Here's the bracket for the Utah Utes, which are uh, going to be a, a tough out for anybody, obviously, with that experience and Andre Miller running the show there. Washington with a big seven-footer, Todd McCullough, a potential second-round opponent in Miami of Ohio, always a tough out there. Yeah, Washington's really solid. They're the fourth-best team coming from the Pac-10. But look at that three seed. Look out. We saw what they did in the Southeastern Conference Tournament. Kentucky with Tubby Smith. They did it last year. They're in a bracket right now where they can do it again this year. Other side of this bracket, the Midwest region, these games are going to be played in Milwaukee. Once again, Michigan State, the top seed. But look at the other side of the bracket there. Arizona is a team with Jason Terry. Very dangerous team as a four seed. The year that the Cats won the national championship, remember, they were the fifth place team in the Pac-10, had a quiet regular season. Well, I take a look at Arizona, the way they grew as a team, not just Jason Terry, but A.J. Bramlett. The points in the paint, the rebounding. This is a the team that you got to be careful of when you look at the teams in this bracket. Michigan State solid, but I love Arizona. And that's a very interesting 5 versus 12 matchup. I don't know that there's a big difference between UNC, Charlotte, Rhode Island, and talent at all. Remember that the 12 seeds historically always get a 5 seed. There's always an upset in that 5 versus 12 matchup. All right, back down to Dick. Your thoughts on that uh, Midwest region. Lamar Odom and company, I know you think that's a very dangerous 12 seed. Well, he's a very dangerous club because he's the best pure talent in America, and he can carry a basketball team. But I have a little thought on Utah as a number two seed there. I know they got the great winning streak, but think about this. If you're Rick Majerus, you're staring at that number three Kentucky. You ready for this? In the 90s, the last four times in the 90s, last year the national championship, Utah loses to Kentucky. They lost to them in 97 in a regional final. They've lost to them four times in a row in the 90s. They want no part, baby, of Kentucky. And I think Kentucky's going to get out of there. I know a great matchup in round two. Think about it. Who'd ever dreamt? Kentucky and Kansas, most likely, playing in a second round game. That's amazing. And I look for Kentucky to win win that region and go to the final four for the fourth time. I know those kids, they just know how to win. 
Certainly not surprised to see Kentucky in that Midwest region. Games down there in New Orleans. The committee says that uh, ticket sales have nothing to do with where they place teams. But, you know, nobody travels like Kentucky. They're going to fill a lot of those seats down there in the Superdome. Kansas will not have any benefit of playing close to home. They're used to being a high seed, used to getting perhaps that benefit. But Kansas, Kentucky, you're right. A great potential, potential second-round matchup. They, of course, met in the grade eight. Well, this party continues down there at Auburn. Tigers fans and cheerleaders celebrating their number one seed in the South. We've got a lot more coming up. I'm asking myself, did this guy give it his best shot? All the incentives plus the best possible financing? Or does he still have a bullet left in the chamber? Well, does he? Bob Roman, make my deal. There's only one, Bob Roman. Now is the time to buy. It's make my deal days. Highest discounts, lowest financing. Only at the Bob Roman Auto Group, Sagamore Parkway, Lafayette. I'm Wilford Brimley. I love my flowers. And for them, this is absolutely perfect. It's called a leverage digger. Introducing the Leverage Digger Cultivator. It features a patented leverage bar that creates maximum power and easy gardening. The T-Grip makes it easy to dig up weeds, and creating beautiful flower gardens is a breeze. With Leverage, gardening just got a whole lot easier. The Leverage Digger is available at these fine retailers. For more information, call 1-800-257-5700. I'm going to use it. I hope you do the same. Toes sniff out a white plate. The nation hot glued to a half second. Old dusty legends step back. A superstar comes home, and a hat made of American cotton follows behind. We see it. Sports Center of the Decade, Tuesday at 8.30 on ESPN. Presented by General Motors.